Hello and welcome to Ridge Church. My name is Krista and I'm your online host today. And we just wanna say a special welcome to anybody who is new to this online service. We'd actually love for you to go and connect with us so that we can connect back with you. And you can actually do that with a really simple uh, text by texting the word hello to the number on the back of the screen. We would love that because Dana, our Director of Connection and Community, would love to make sure that you are known here at Ridge Church, even though you might not be in the building with us. We also care deeply about the fact that you are known by Jesus and that you're able to know who he is as well. And so by going on the website at ridgechurch.ca slash knowjesus, that's just an amazing way where you can see the, the heart of what Pastor Jonathan cares about with just making sure that people have access to, to knowledge of who he is, of who Jesus is and what that means to us and how he provides life transformation. And so you can go and check that out. There's also a little button there that says starting point. And that is an eight week course that sort of wrestles through some of the big life questions that we have about who God is and, and do we have purpose and, and even who Jesus is. And so again, I want to encourage you towards that. We actually have that class on Zoom as well. So again, if you're just feeling a little bit nervous about being in the building with us and, and sort of being close proximity with other people, that's a great option for you. But I do also want to remind those of us who are able to come and gather here on a Sunday morning that we meet every Sunday, 1030 a.m. here in the building to worship together, to be in God's word together and to build community. It's a wonderful picture of what the church is. And so, again, a small encouragement towards that when you feel comfortable. We also care deeply about community here at Ridge Church. And so we have these things called community groups. And this is the time in the year when those launch back again. And so we wanna encourage you towards that. You can actually connect with Dana again at ridgechurch.ca. And she would love to sort of figure out where you best fit in community here at Ridge Church. Also on Sunday morning, as I mentioned, we are going through the sermon series and that's what we're going through here online as well. And right now we are in our current sermon series entitled Sovereign. And that's walking us through the beginning chapters of the book of Exodus. And so we hope that you continue to track alongside with us as we walk that together. A small note on giving here at Ridge Church, if you um, enjoy what's being shared in these online services, consider giving to the ministry that's going forward here. You can do that by texting the word GIVE to 778-716-6722. And for that, we just thank you for your partnership. In this moment, we're gonna take about 10 seconds to just settle our hearts and prepare for service. So why don't you join me and do that? And I'm just gonna pray for us as we lead into service. Father, we just thank you again that we can gather in these online services. We thank you that you are with us wherever we find ourselves, whether our bedroom, our living room, or even if we're on vacation. And God, that we can be the church body. Um, it's so amazing. Father, I just pray that as we worship together, as we hear a message from your word, God, that it would just continue to work in our lives, that you would transform us. Um, and that you would just do a work in us that only you can do. And God, we just commit this time to you and we ask you to move in a mighty way. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's worship together. And I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me Treasures that fade are never enough. And you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love.
Well, good morning. If you are just new with us, a special welcome to you. My name is Jonathan, and uh, we have been over the last number of months walking through the opening chapters in the book of Exodus. And over the last uh, two weeks, we have been looking at the call that God has put on Moses' life. And it's this call for him to leave Egypt, uh, sorry, leave the, leave the wilderness, go back to Egypt and invite the people of Israel, lead the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. But almost from the moment that God puts this call on Moses' life, he's come up with all of these reasons why he shouldn't do it, all these questions. In fact, as we've looked, he's got five different questions or, or objections to the call of God on his life. And they reveal a lot about him. They, they reveal, first of all, his insecurities. It's like, God, who, who am I that you would call me to do this? And then his doubts, like, God, who are you? And then also reveal some of his fears and some of his hurts from the past. He's like, even if I do, will they, will they believe me? Will they, will they listen to me? And then also reveal some of his questions about his own skill set. He's like, God, I'm not eloquent. How can I, how can I do all of this? And, and then in the end, it also the last question is like, God, don't, don't, don't send me. Send someone else. And we just see this, this open disobedience in Moses' life. And it's fascinating because it helps us see that Moses was no, no great hero, no extraordinary, you know, giant of the faith who was just waiting for God to call him and marched off to do what he wanted to do. He was, a, he was an 80-year-old man who had insecurities and fears and hurts and doubts. And yet this is who God wants to work through. This is who God chooses to work through. Well, it's not unlike us in many ways, is it? And so God comes to him and he asks him to do this. And now at, this, at the end of all of these objections, at the end of all of these misgivings, he comes to this pivotal moment in his life, this, this key sort of crossroads. And, and the question is this, Moses has to decide now whether he's going to be obedient to God or not. And this is really the moment of truth because you see, it is possible. It is possible to have a profound encounter with God. To meet God at a burning bush and understand that God is Yahweh, the great I am, the, the, the sovereign God over all of creation, and yet still not obey him. And this is a moment that Moses could have chosen instead to remain as a shepherd in Midian. Now, he would have been a very different shepherd. I mean, he would have become a deeply religious man. He, he would have been a, a man who, who, you know, talked constantly about his, his encounters with God, who who lived differently now because of he had met God. He would have been the kind of guy who would have lived a holy life and, and a very different life. Uh, he, you know, he would, have, he would have gone to Sabbath or prayed during Sabbath all the time. And he would have become a very good, very religious man. In fact, the Midianites living around there, if you ask them about that shepherd Moses, they would have said, oh, he's a guy who takes his religion very seriously. And, and it would have been... I mean, Moses could have felt good about it. Look, I'm serious about my relationship with God. But see, if he never chose to be obedient to God, if he never obeyed what God asked him to do, then he would have never had a true faith in God. And of course, the same is true for us today when it comes to following after Jesus. It is possible to have a profound genuine interaction with Jesus to, 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 in, to write, to have some sort of prayer of commitment to Jesus and say, you know, I know what Jesus did for me on the cross. I understand grace and forgiveness. I know theology. I understand, you know, reformed doctrine to, to know all of those things. But to not actually have personal obedience to Christ. I mean, we can be passionate about all sorts of things. We can, we can do things in light of it. But if there is no personal obedience to Jesus in our lives, then there is no discipleship to Jesus. And if there is no discipleship to Jesus, then Jesus isn't really part of the thing. Then, then we end up with what the, the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer called a myth. And an abstract faith that's all about the, this God who's lovely and warm and sovereign over all of creation, looking out for us, this, this very good God. But we utterly abandon that part of following God, following Jesus that requires us to be obedient. We, we miss the whole area of discipleship. In fact, discipleship requires obedience. And without obedience, we just are, end up being just nice religious people. See, this is the point. A belief system without obedience is simply nice religion. 
And this is where Moses finds himself now in this story that we are coming to. It's a crossroads in his life. It is this, this key moment. He's been called by God to this task that is both very daunting and in some ways downright dangerous. It forces him to deal with his past and the hurts there and his insecurities and his fears and, and to step out and to trust God even when he has doubts. And the question now for Moses is this. Moses, are you going to become a nice religious man who is a shepherd in Midian or are you going to become a man of faith? who's obedient to what God calls him to be. And and this is the question that comes to each of us too. I mean, there comes a point in our lives where we have to ask, are we going to be good religious people? Which is, you know, which is nice, which is fine. It used to be mildly applauded in our culture, although not so much these days. Or are we going to become men and women of faith who not only believe in a sovereign God that is in control over the entire universe and in our own lives, but who also act in obedience to what God calls us to do? This is the question that comes to Moses now in this story that we're going to pick up now in the middle of Exodus. Moses, what's it going to be? And now here's how Moses responds. Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, this is what it says. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they're still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt for all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Moses chooses obedience. Moses decides that he's going to be obedient to what God says that he should do. But but notice that he still is struggling with this. He's still not like fully in on it. Like he he goes back to see Jethro and he doesn't say, hey, Jethro, I was out tending the sheep. There was this burning bush. God spoke to me. He's called me to go back to Egypt and lead the people of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. That's not what he says. He says to Jethro, he says, "Uh, do you mind if I have permission to go back to Egypt and just see if any of my, you know, any of my people are still alive? You see, he's still not sure about this whole thing. But still, because he wants to be obedient to God, he takes a step. He moves on what God says. He takes action. And this is the the point. Obedience requires us to take a step of action. It's the key to obedience. You might not be 100% confident of what's going to happen. In fact, I'm sure that you won't be 100% confident of what is going to happen if you're obedient to God. But you have to take a step that moves you out of your place of safety into a place where you have to trust God. That's what obedience is about. And this is what Moses does. He goes to his father-in-law, who also happens to be his employer. He says, I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to take your daughter and your grandson, my wife and my sons, and we're going to go to Egypt. We're We're going to leave this place of safety, and we're going to end up in a place in the wilderness, on our way to a place that we know is not necessarily safe. And it's in that place... It's in that place that he is going to learn, (coughs) excuse me, he's going to learn faith in God. And the same is true for us when it comes to being obedient in Jesus, to Jesus. It requires us to take a step of action, to, to move out of a safe place and to watch and see that God is faithful to us in the midst of that. And too often, you know, when it comes to being obedient, we, we kind of start with this like, well, really God, already? Like, God, don't you think I should know the Bible better before we do this? I mean, don't, don't you think I should be clearer on all the theology of the New Testament? And In fact, God, don't you think it would probably be better if I understood all of Leviticus first before I take this step of faith? Because I need to know that so I have the faith to be obedient. And, and, and God, don't you think it would be better if I went to church for a little longer before I took this act of obedience? And the answer is no. No, no, because you're, you're, you're talking to, to God to the one who is sovereign over all, who who requires obedience by the very nature of who he is. You see, the life of a follower of Jesus is characterized by obedience to God because of who Jesus and who God is. See, for Moses, if he had refused to obey God and he, he just stayed in Midian, he would have never learned to have faith. And even though he struggles with taking this step of of obedience, even though it's hard, he still takes a step. And that's what God asks. 
fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, again, he writes this, the road to faith passes through obedience to the call of God. He goes on to say that if we imagine that we're following God, if you think that somehow you're following Jesus, but you're not willing to take a step of action, then you're deluding yourself. And here's the paradox about this whole thing of, of faith and obedience. They, they, they go together. You see, you need faith to take a step of obedience. But it's only when you take a step of obedience that you grow that you have faith. Right? Let me say again. You need faith to, to be obedient, but the obedience causes faith in you. So the, the two sides of the same coin. Too, too often people say, well, I can't be obedient until I have enough faith. I, I just... You know, when I have enough faith, then I'm going to obey what Jesus tells me to. And of course, you have to have enough faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that God is sovereign over all. But then the question is, well, how, when, do you draw the, when do you cross the line? I mean, how much faith do you need till you are obedient? And the answer is, no, no. As soon as you believe that God is who he is, that Jesus is the Son of God, that the call in your life and mine is to take that step, as tentative as it may be, with as many doubts as we may have, and be obedient. So if you have enough faith to be obedient, you should take the step and be obedient. And if you don't have enough faith to be obedient, you should take the step anyway. Because in taking the step, you will learn the kind of obedience. Uh, in, in taking the step of obedience, you will learn the kind of faith that God wants to put in your life. Obedience and faith go hand in hand. And without obedience, all you have is just kind of a nice little religion. Moses takes his first step. He goes to his father-in-law, he gets his wife and his sons, he puts them on a donkey, and he heads towards Egypt. And here's what happens next. In verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve you, serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So now Moses has taken this tentative step, and God shows up and says, okay, Moses, here's what you're going to do when you get there. And I want you to notice exactly what it is that God is asking Moses to do. He's got four different things. First of all, he says this, I want you to appear before Pharaoh in person. Personally, you're going to go before him. There's no carrier pigeons, no writing on parchment and mailing it to him, no, no even sending a delegate. You go and you stand before the most powerful man in the world, and you do what I tell you to do. Mo's like, okay, I think I can do that. Step two, he says, I want you to do the miracles that I've already showed you. You know, you take your staff and throw it down, it becomes a snake. You, you pick it up again, it becomes a staff. You put your hand in your cloak and it comes out leprous. You put it in again and, and it comes out clean again. You do that. And I was like, yeah, I, I, I can do that. And then the third thing he says is this. When you do that, when you are obedient to what I tell you to do, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I can imagine Moses saying, what, what, God, whoa, whoa, whoa. Feels a little counterintuitive to me. Like down here, if we want someone to do something, we try to soften their heart, not harden their heart. And God says, no, no. I'm going to harden his heart. It's not what you expect, but it's what I am going to do, even as you're obedient to me. Now, why God would harden Pharaoh's heart, we're going to talk about later on, because it, it comes up down the road again. And we'll say, what, why would you do that, God? We'll talk about that. But for today, I just want you to notice that what God is asking Moses to do is different than what he thinks the, the thing is going to do. And then the fourth thing he asks him to do, he says, look, once you, what, after that, I want you to tell Pharaoh that, that Israel is my firstborn son. And, and because Israel is my firstborn son and you have mistreated him, when you don't let my people go, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. The one who's next in line to the throne. Now, in that kind of a setting, that's a very dangerous thing to say. I mean, Moses didn't show up with, a, with a, you know, a giant bodyguard around him. He is defenseless in the courts of Pharaoh. And he says, look, you do what I tell you that God is telling you to do, or he's going to kill your son. That's the kind of thing that would get you killed in that setting. I mean, that's like going into a biker bar and looking for the toughest, meanest, ugliest biker who's been boozing all day, walk up to him, and in front of his girlfriend, insult his girlfriend and say, God told me to. Now, now don't do that. That, that, I mean, if you do that, you're headed for a world of pain. But that's kind of like what God is asking Moses to do here. 
God asked Moses to do these very things. And, and here's the thing you need to notice about obedience. The next thing. Obedience requires us to do hard things. Look, if they weren't hard, if it was easy, it wouldn't be about faith. Everyone would do it just because it feels good. Listen to what Jesus says. He says this. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yeah, that feels good. Someone punched me in the head, I punched them in the head. Jesus goes on, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. That's hard. And then he goes on to say, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Yeah, I get that. Everyone does that. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? She says, look, if you're just doing the same as everyone else, that's not obedience to me. That's just doing the same thing that everyone would naturally do. Obedience to God requires you to do hard things. Look, you come to church on a Sunday morning, you come to worship, and as you're walking into the auditorium, you see a brother or sister that you've got an issue with. You know what Jesus says? Before you worship, before you present your gift to the altar, go and find that person in the lobby and make it right with them. That's hard to do. He says, look, don't even look at a woman lustfully, because if you do, it's like committing adultery with her in your heart. That's hard to do. He says, look, store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy. Not down here where they're all going to end up being destroyed in the end. Hard to do. He says, you know, don't, don't be anxious about anything. Hard. Don't judge others. Hard. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. Not what is due to them for their stupidity. Hard. You see, being obedient to Jesus is hard. It's the narrow way. The things he calls us to cause us to tremble. To, to, sort of suck in our breath and say, really, Jesus, is that, is that what you demand of me if I'm following you? And yet this is where faith grows. This is where God works in the midst of our obedience. And just like Moses, it won't necessarily go the way that we think it ought to be. Moses thinks that when he performs the miracles, that it should soften Moses' heart. And God says, no, I'm going to harden his heart. And Moses says, you know, you want me to say these hard things in front of him in person? God says, yeah but I will be with you when you do those things. Now, for Moses, notice that, that in his case, the, the confrontation that, that he has with Pharaoh, and really, it's, it's really, as we'll see, it's a confrontation between God and Pharaoh, is over firstborn sons. And, and God, you know, in, in the ancient world, the firstborn son had a, a special place in the family. Firstborn son would get a double portion of the inheritance over the, the other sons. And the firstborn son would become sort of the representative of the family as he grew older. And, and he would have all these rights and all of these responsibilities. And, and God's quarrel with Pharaoh is really about his firstborn son. He's, you know, Pharaoh has treated Israel like a second grade, second class, subhuman species of slaves that he just uses and works to death. But for God, they're his own sons and daughters. He loves them so, so deeply. He loves them so deeply, and so he's come to set his people free from slavery to Pharaoh. And now, and now, you and I, through Jesus, we have also become the firstborn for God. We, we are his firstborn sons and daughters. Hey, we're not just a project to God. We're not just a charity case. He felt bad. He's like, I got to do something for them. No, no. He loves us so, so deeply because we're his sons and daughters. And this is why he demands and requires that we do these hard and difficult things. Because you see, he, he does it because he loves us. Not because he's cruel and demanding like Pharaoh, but rather because he's loving and caring like a good father, like a good parent. I mean, he wants what's best for you like a good father would, like a good parent would. And therefore, he requires you to do hard things. And, and, and we all understand this if we're parents. We require our children to do things that they don't want to do because we know that in the end, it's best for them. We require our children, we teach our children to work hard, even when they don't feel like working hard. 
We, we, we teach our children to be polite and kind even when they don't feel like being polite and kind. We require our children to be respectful and to be gentle and to be kind even when they don't feel like being respectful or gentle or kind. Why? Why? Because we know that in the long run, that's for their benefit. In the short run, they say, ah, oh, this is dumb. Why do I have to do this? I don't want to. Yeah, I, I know, but in the long run, you will thank me because in the long run, this will lead to your success in life. And the same is true when it comes for our being obedient to God. God doesn't do it just because. He does it because what he calls us to do is for our benefit and for God's ultimate glory. And so, following God, being obedient to God, requires us to do hard things. Now, after laying that out, now, now in the next part of this passage, we come to one of the strangest, one of the most puzzling verses in all of Exodus. God has been... Uh, or the passage has been talking about God's firstborn son and, and Pharaoh's firstborn son. And now God's going to turn his attention to Moses' firstborn son. Look at what happens next. Verse 24. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah, his wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me. So he, God, let Moses alone. It was then that she said, a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now that's a strange passage. I mean, there's been a lot of ink uh, spilled trying to understand all the details around what's happening in this passage. But the basics are fairly clear. Uh, on their way to Egypt, Moses and his family find a place to lodge for the night, and God comes to kill Moses. Now, it doesn't say how. Maybe the angel of the Lord appeared in the middle of the night and they began to wrestle. Or maybe just a deadly disease struck Moses and was, was, you know, sucking the life out of him. We don't know. But the question isn't really how. The question is why. Why would God call Moses and then come to strike him down? And it's related to the fact that his firstborn son had not been circumcised. In fact, if you go back into the book of Genesis, God says this to Abraham. God said to Abraham, as for you, you should keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout all their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. And then he writes this, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. So God gives Abraham this command. He says, circumcision is a sign of the covenant that I have between me and my people. And it's a very simple Act of obedience has been done to a, 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 a Jewish boy eight days after he's born. And yet Moses, years later, has not circumcised his own son. And, and, and God is not about to allow Moses to lead God's firstborn son, the people of Israel, out of the land of Egypt if Moses hasn't even been obedient enough to circumcise his firstborn son in light of what is a very clear command of God. The problem is, it's been so long since th that Moses has ignored this that he doesn't even notice it anymore. But he has a good wife. Thank goodness for good wives. In fact, I was just talking to a guy the other day. We were talking about how good our wives are to us. And he pointed out that the statistics show that, that men who are, aren't married have a tendency to live shorter. Their wives help them live longer. And certainly that's the case here for Moses here. His life would have been a lot shorter had it not been for a good wife. And she understands right away what the problem is. The problem is, is that Moses has been disobedient in this area. And so she steps in right away and she circumcises their son. And as a result, God relents and leaves Moses alone. And the rest of the, the description there of, of what she says, it seems to be the words of an ancient, circ, uh, ancient circumcision ceremony. But the point is this. Here, here's the point. A failure to be obedient to God's commands can can result or can have significant consequences in our lives. Obviously, in Moses' case, it could have led to death. Now, Moses lived under a different covenant than we do, and the calling on his life was very high compared to the calling on our lives. But nevertheless, 
Even in the New Testament, we have a record of the Apostle Paul saying that, that some of the church members had been flippant towards taking communion, and as a result, they, God had caused them to die. The, the, the point is, the, the broader point is this, we should never take lightly disobedience towards God, because he doesn't take that lightly. His commands are for our benefit, and when we fail to obey him, there are consequences. Now, typically, in, almost, in most cases, those consequences are just the natural consequences of the failure to be God. Broken relationships, a weak and anemic faith, a, a, a failure to live in the fullness of the life that God calls us to live. But very clearly, we need to understand that, that disobedience to God has consequences in our life. Here's where the story goes next. In verse 27, it says this. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Aaron is Moses' brother. And now God sees that Moses is going to be obedient and he sends his brother, Moses' brother Aaron, to walk with him. And here again is the next point. Obedience is easier when you walk together with a brother or sister. Look, Moses has this call on his life. God sends Aaron, and it says, he tells Aaron everything. He told Aaron, like, this is, this is the call that God put on my life. This is the burning bush, what happened. These are the, these are the, the insecurities and the fears that I have and the, the questions that I ask God. And this is what God told me. And, and then I, I took this step of faith. And, and then this is what God commanded me to do. He told Aaron everything. And Aaron said, okay, brother. Okay, brother, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to go with you. We're, we'll do this thing together. I'll stand with you. I'll listen to you when, you're, when your heart is breaking. I will care for you. I will push you on. I will stand behind you. I will be with you in this. It's pretty cool. Do you have someone like that in your world? You know, in my world, I got a buddy who's kind of like that. Uh, we, we kind of walked through a lot of these things together. And not long ago, he, he told me again, he said, man, there's just pressure in his workplace and and his bosses who should be helping him out are actually constantly kind of trying to attack him. And, and he said, John, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to act in this way, how to, how to act as a follower of Jesus as in this place. Because the way that he's going to act is very different than someone who isn't a follower of Jesus. And so we talked about it and we prayed about it. And I said, yeah, okay. And he texted me a little while later, about half hour later, and he said this, thanks for being encouraging. I, I know if I was off base, you would check me. And then he wrote Proverbs 17, 17. And I text back, yep, I check you, you check me. Brothers, following Jesus together. And Proverbs 17, 17, which he texted me, says this, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A brother is born for adversity. Do you have a brother like that, a sister like that? Someone who is there for adversity. Someone who is there in the midst of the pressures of your life that says, I'll walk with you. I'll care for you. I mean, I mean, you know, to have, to have someone to walk with helps you be obedient to Christ. To have a brother in Christ to walk with, say, look, I'm struggling with this porn thing, and I, I know that I need to kick it. I confess to you that I got a problem. Would you help me? The brother says, yeah, I get it. I'll walk with you. Or, 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 or to say, you know, I know that I need to love the enemy in my world who happens to be the person in the cubicle next to me or my coworker in the job site next to me. How on earth am I going to love them? And to have a brother or sister who says, I'll walk with you. I'll pray with you. When they're driving you crazy, you come talk to me and I'll remind you what Jesus says. Or to have a sister in Christ that you can go to and say, look, my husband, my husband has hurt me so deeply. I don't know if I want to stay married to this man. And they listen and they hear and they, they, they feel for you, but they don't pile on and say, yeah, he's an idiot. No, no. Rather they say, yes, but this is what Jesus calls you to do. To love and to respect and to seek reconciliation in your life. And then to walk with you as you seek that very thing. Now, can you do all those things on your own? Of course you can. But it's so much easier to have a brother or sister in Christ to walk with you when you do that. That's why we value community so deeply here at Ridge Church. That's why we call on everyone who calls this church home to have some kind of significant, genuine, biblical relationships with a few others so that they can walk together. Because see, a friend loves at all times. And a brother or sister is born for adversity and being obedient to Christ is easier when you're walking with someone. Here's how the section ends. Verse 29. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. 
Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshipped. Man, what a great ending to this section. You know, it started with Moses saying, I don't know if they're going to believe me, God. I don't know if I can do this. And then he does these things, a tentative step and, and listening to God and, 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 and learning some hard lessons on the way and, and having his brother join him. And then he goes and he's obedient to what God says. And the people believed him. Just like God said it would happen. And, and not only that, they bowed their heads and they worshiped God. See, here's the thing about obedience. Your obedience will lead people to believe and to worship God. I mean, how many times have you heard stories of people who have, who have been obedient to God and others who have been watching, they've seen not a nice religious person who has this sort of abstract idea of God, but rather they've watched somebody who has done something that's hard, something that's countercultural, something that is very different than the world around them. They've watched that and they said, wow, how can they do that? What gives them the courage and the strength to live that way? And it leads those people to come to know God and to believe in God and to worship him. Oh, that we would get our eyes off of ourselves and see with the eyes of Jesus what he can and will do if we are obedient to him. Obedience to him is not easy. It's a hard thing. But it's exhilarating and, 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 it, and it's life-giving when we do it. And lives are changed and people are touched. And it's not about a religious kind of nice life. It's about an adventurous life. Sometimes not an easy life. But it's a life that is filled with purpose and meaning and, and joy even in the midst of the struggles. And where, and where lives are changed. And where our relationship with God goes deeper and our faith gets stronger because we live in obedience to him. It's fascinating. Moses started with such a tentative little step going to his father-in-law. But it tells us later in Exodus, near the end, that Moses used to meet with God face to face and talk to God as a man talks to his friend. Why? Because he was obedient to God and his faith grew and it led to that kind of a relationship. You see, when we're obedient to God and, uh, and the faith grows, we have this deep, rich relationship that grows with God, the God of all creation. Listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus says this in John 14. If you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love Jesus, you will keep his commands. The thing is, it's not easy, is it? I mean, I know this. I'm not always so good at keeping Jesus' commands. And, and I know that you know it. It's, it's hard to keep Jesus' commands. And you need to know that the, the, the goal of this message is not to, be, to bring guilt or, or shame on, on anyone. It's not that you sit there saying, oh, I haven't been obedient. Oh, I'm a terrible person. I'm so, I feel good. That's not the goal. Nor is the goal somehow to make you think that, that if you want to please God, if you, if you want to earn righteousness before God, that you need to, to do all of these things. We know that we're righteous before God because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. That's not the message either. Rather, the message here, what, what you need to hear is that obedience to God is not only a call and a way of life for those who follow God, but it is for our benefit and ultimately for God's glory. The call on our life then is to, to go and to be obedient to him because of his deep, deep love for us, because he cares for us so, so deeply and he wants us to flourish. And because when we're obedient to him, then others see and say, wow. That's what it means to follow the living God. I want that. And they end up worshiping God. And, 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 and we grow in our faith. And look, all of this, you know, Jesus tells us that we need to do it because we, we love him. But he doesn't expect us to do it all in our own strength. He knows how hard it is. So immediately after he tells us this, you know, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. The very next words are this. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. But he also says, if you love me, I will send you a helper, the Holy Spirit, who will dwell in you, and he will help you to live the life that I'm calling you to live. 
Now, that doesn't mean we become a robot and he just makes it possible for us. You know, we just do everything, uh, are always obedient. That's not the message. We still have a part to play. But when we step out in obedience, then the Spirit comes and gives us strength and courage and perseverance and grace and grit and helps us to be obedient to the life that Jesus calls us to live. And that becomes rich. And that becomes beautiful. And God works in our life and our faith grows. And God receives the glory. May we be a people who live in obedience to our God. Would you bow your head with me? Let's, let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, and God, we thank you that we can address you as our Father. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, and God, we confess off the top what you already know, that God, too often we are disobedient. God, too often we don't walk in obedience to your word, to your commands, and we do it to our own detriment. God, we do it to, to, to our own uh, long-term pain and, and, and issues in our life. God, forgive us for our sin. God, forgive us for our disobedience. God, help us to see the beauty and the value of being obedient, of taking a step, even a tentative step when we're not 100% sure and saying, because I know the character of my God and because he calls me to this, I will do it even though I'm scared and insecure and have my questions. And God, as we do that, may our, may our faith grow. May we know, I mean, we will see your faithfulness. And Lord, may our faith grow. And so I pray for each of us, God, lead us on, call us forward, invite us to step out of that safe place to that place where we have to live and trust in you. And then, God, work in our lives in beautiful ways. We give ourselves to you again today. Father, help us to follow in the footsteps of Moses and to be obedient for our benefit and for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my savior on that cursed tree body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all the
the night And I will rise among the saints My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face Thank you for joining us again today. I hope that this has been a rich time again of, of worshiping together and being in God's Word. And, and I want to end by reading to you these words by the Apostle Paul. He says this, I, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The call on your life and mine is to present our lives, our very bodies, as an act of worship in obedience to God that he might be glorified in our lives. May we live this way in all that we do. God bless you. Have a great week. I will see you again next week.